storm of Odin, last born hound of the wild hunt that runs across the plains of the sky on stormy nights. He was barely four months old, but almost as tall as the crimson-tailed horses that raced before him. His coat was the black of the deepest midnight. His eyes shone golden bright, alive with excitement. He was Storm of Odin, and this was his first hunt. He opened his mouth and howled, his voice joining the cries of the pack around. The scream of hunting horns echoed between the wide horizons, and moonlight glanced off the hunters' helmets and the tips of their spears. Sky and earth trembled. He was Storm of Odin and he was having a little trouble keeping up. He ran as fast as ever. Faster it seemed now because he was straining, his muscles beginning to ache and the wild joy of the hunt was overtaken by an uneasy feeling that all was not well. He dropped his head and his howls became a series of pants and grunts as he struggled to keep his legs moving. The crimson horse tails were no longer in his face, but flickered in the darkness ahead. The storm hound slowed, and his paws began to sink through the cloud. He howled again, his voice less like thunder across cloud-topped mountains, and more a cry of, um, hey, wait for me. No one heard. No one waited. The wild hunt rushed on. Far behind them all, Storm of Odin uttered a final yelp and fell from the sky. Hello, my name is Claire Fayers and I am really happy to be joining you today as part of the first online Abergavenny Books Festival. Now, I am talking to you from my office in my home in Cardiff where I have been for most of the past two or three weeks. And in fact, since lockdowns first began in March, I've spent an awful lot of time sitting in this room. And that's not nearly as bad as you would think, because this is the room where I keep my books. And as everybody knows, reading can take you absolutely anywhere. So while I've been here, I have been having a quick run around the Greek islands and I've walked to ancient Egypt. I've nipped across to Spain for a quick holiday. We've gone to France to visit the Musketeers. We have gone, we have gone around the world in 80 days with Jules Verne, all the way around the world and back again. We've visited different parts of Wales with Catherine Fisher and China with Grace Lynn. I have solved mysteries. I have searched for ghosts. I have got on a magic train. And of course, I have been spending a lot of time in my favourite place in the world, which is Abergavenny, from my own book, Stormhound. Now, Stormhound is the story of Storm who is a great, an enormous, a fierce, a legendary, a mythical hunting hound belonging to the Norse god Odin. You might have heard of Odin. Odin, the king of the gods, the Allfather, the Furious, the god of wisdom, the god of war, the god of magic, the Wanderer, also known as Wotan and Woden where we get our word Wednesday. Odin, the god of Wednesday. Odin lives in Asgard, which is the home of the Norse gods. He is married to the goddess Frigg, who is very, very beautiful, so I've been told. And Frigg and Odin together have many, many children. There's a clever one called Loki, and Thor, who is the slightly stupid one with the big hammer. Now, Odin really likes living in Asgard. He's got a big tower right in the middle of the palace and a throne at the top of it. And he can sit there and look out and see everything that is happening right across the worlds. 
But of course, being a god, and especially the god of war and the wanderer and the god of magic, what he really loves best is adventures. And so when the storm clouds roll in across the mortal world and it gets dark and people go into their homes to shelter from the rain, Odin calls his horses and his hounds together and he goes out hunting. And this is where Storm comes in. Storm is the youngest hound in Odin's pack. Only six months old, but the size of a horse with great big fierce shiny golden eyes and great big mouth full of fierce sharp white teeth. And he cannot wait to get out and run across the sky with the rest of the pack. And finally, the big night comes. The storm clouds roll in and Odin calls his pack together and Storm joins them excitedly. But as they start to run, something goes wrong. He finds that he can't keep up. He's struggling and falling further and further behind. And then he starts to fall out of the sky altogether and he crash lands to earth, landing in a field of very surprised looking sheep just outside the small Welsh town of Abergavenny. And if you thought that might be a shock for Storm, the next thing is worse again. He very soon discovers that when back in the world of Odin, he was a great big, fierce, enormous, legendary creature with great big golden eyes and a great big mouth full of sharp white teeth. He was still only six months old. And so here in the mortal world, he looks more like this. And that is where Storm's adventure starts. If you want to know what he gets up to in Wales and whether he manages to get back home to Odin's halls and the rest of his pack, you'll have to read the rest of the book to see what happens. A lot of people have asked me why I decided to set Stormhound in Abergavenny. I'm, if a great mythical fierce hunting hound is going to drop suddenly out of the sky, then why didn't he fall in, say, New York, where you've got superheroes who could fight him? Or why didn't he fall in London and crush Big Ben or something? Why sheep and mountains and a small town? And well, the first reason is that I live near Abergavenny and I really like the area. And then I was actually in the town doing some school visits when I was starting to come up with ideas for the book. So as I was thinking about the book and what could happen, I was looking about seeing mountains and the different places around the town and the things just started to fit in together. And another reason is that I just think there should be more books set in Wales. It's a really great country. We've got a massive history of magic and legend and folklore and things that have happened in this country. And the stories of people here deserve to be told more often. We often think that exciting and fantastic stories have to happen in far away, well, made up fantasy worlds or exotic places. And when we live in a place all our lives, we forget to see the magic that's there all around us all the time. It just becomes ordinary because it's home. But Wales is anything but ordinary. Odin might have Asgard and his hounds of his wild hunt. We have got Anun, the realm of magic, ruled over by King Aron of the Fair Folk, the Tulwith Teg, who have lived in this country for centuries and centuries before humans even came here. And we have got the hounds of Anun as well, just like Odin's wild hunt. These hounds though are white with red ears and red tails. If you happen to stray onto the mountains on a stormy night, you might see them running. If you do, whatever you do, do not follow them to see where they're going because you could end up straying into Anon 
and it will take you a hundred years to find your way home again. It is so much magic around in the Black Mountains and different stories for people who want to go looking for them. When I was researching different Welsh stories to put in the Stormhound, I came across the Skirid Inn. I don't know if you visited, it's the most haunted building in the whole of Britain, apparently, with hundreds and hundreds of different ghosts there. And if you go up Mount Skirid itself, you'll notice that the top, unlike a lot of other mountains, which are flat or nicely curved, has got this jagged hole in it, as if somebody has taken a huge piece out of the top. And there's a story about that. I was very lucky this year to be asked to write a collection of Welsh fairy tales and folk tales, which is coming out next year. There's the cover. It's not out for sale yet, but you'll be able to find it from about the end of February in shops. So have a look out for that. And I went all over Wales looking for different stories. And this is one about Mount Skirid and how it got its name. It is called The Devil and Giant Jack. If you climb to the top of Mount Skirid, you will see a large flat stone on the summit looking a bit like a table. This stone is called the Devil's Table because, as everybody knows, this is where the Devil used to come to play cards with Giant Jack. Now, the Devil in Welsh stories is a bit different from the Devil in other stories. He's a bit of a tricksy type of character. He likes to play games and have silly bets with people. And he's not very bright. So the people in Wales are always getting the better of him. And Giant Jack had known the devil for a very long time and was not in the slightest afraid of him. Jack's real name was Jack O'Kent and he lived in the border country between England and Wales. He was a magician and people called him Giant Jack because, well, if you ever decide to invite Jack to your home for tea, you'd better make it a picnic in the garden. Otherwise, he might accidentally pull your front door off his hinges or break all your furniture or stick his head through your ceiling. One warm day, Jack and the devil were sitting on the gently rounded peak of Mount Skirit. This was before it was called Mount Skirit, of course. Between the devil and the giant, lay the large flat rock called the Devil's Table, and on the table was a pack of cards. Some of the cards had been torn in two. You cheated! the Devil shouted, tearing up another card. You started it! Giant Jack said. You've been cheating all day, and I've still won every game. Ah! The Devil hit all the cards off the table. Several of them burst into flame. Let's play something else, Jack said, partly because the devil was getting into a bit of a mood and partly because the cards were all burnt. He grinned and stretched out his long legs, putting his boots up on the table. Well, he said, today is a beautiful day. If the devil hadn't been in such a disagreeable mood, he might well have agreed. It was a day of blue sky fluffy clouds and bright sunshine. From where they were sitting, Jack and the Devil could see all the way across the fields below to the green peak of the Sugarloaf Mountain. It was a good five or six miles to walk it, but it looked close enough that Jack almost thought he could reach out his hand and touch it. He gazed at the Sugarloaf thoughtfully. I bet I could jump over there, he said. I bet you couldn't, the devil shot back. Giant Jack looked at the devil and raised an eyebrow. Is this a real bet or one of your silly dares? The devil spluttered indignantly. I, I, I do not make silly dares. I bet you ten pounds that you can't jump all the way from here to the top of the Sugarloaf Mountain. Giant Jack swung his huge feet off the devil's table. 
You're on, he said. Stand back. The giant bent his knees. The devil scuttled back out of the way. Giant Jack drew in a breath of air so deep that the clouds in the sky were sucked towards him. Then he let his breath out in an almighty roar, swung his arms back and kicked off from the mountain with all of his strength. For a few seconds, it felt like he was flying. He looked down and saw the tiny shapes of people in the fields below staring up at him. A very startled bird flew past. The sugar loaf suddenly seemed an awfully long way away. But Jack windmilled his arms, ran in the air, tumbled over, somersaulted and landed crash right into the ground. He climbed to his feet and looked around and he was standing on the top of the sugar loaf. He had done it. Hey, devil, he shouted, doing a little victory dance. I won the bet. I won the bet. We looked again and noticed there was something slightly odd about the mountain he had just left. When he jumped from there, the peak had been a nice smooth curve. Now there was a jagged hole in the top of it. There was a pop of air and the smell of sulphur next to him. You've broken the mountain, the devil said, peering. It was true. When Jack had made his enormous leap, he'd kicked the ground so hard that he had kicked a great lump of soil out of the top of the mountain. And from then on, the people in the towns around started to call the mountain Ustgrid. Ustgrid means split in Welsh. And from that Welsh word came the English word skirid. And that is how Mount Skirid got its name. Right, now we're going to play a game. And for this game, you will need some pieces of paper, a few pens or pencils, and a dice. If you don't have them to hand, don't worry, you can share mine and we'll do it together. First thing I want you to do is to draw a map. Now, I really love maps. They can show you all sorts of different interesting things about places. So we're going to do one of a place that you know well. It doesn't have to be really artistic or accurate. It's not going to be the way I do it. We just want to have an outline of the shape of the place. And because I'm thinking of Abergavenny today, that's what I'm going to do. There we go. So we've got a few mountains around the town. There we are, different mountains, different shapes. And now you've got your outline. I want you to put the numbers one to six anywhere you like on the map. Three, four, five right in the middle, six down in that corner. Okay, we need to fill our map in. So at each of those numbers, write down a place that you know well. I'm going to put my house, let's pretend I live in Abergavenny for a moment. My, yeah, my school. Think of places, what have we got in Abergavenny? We've got the library. I mustn't forget the library. How about the castle? Let's stick that in the middle. And two more places. Let's see, we'll have the park. Let's put Bailey Park. And we'll have a tea shop. Okay, so we filled our map in. You can colour that in and draw the different pictures of places later if you like. Right now, we know what's going to be on our map, which is great. So I want you to take your dice and roll it. 
Okay, number two, we are in the tea shop. Now, I want you all to close your eyes and imagine that you are in that place, either number two on your list or in the tea shop if you're doing mine. Just picture yourself there now. And it is midnight, not the usual time you would be out. It's very dark, very quiet, and getting quite cold. Now imagine the room around you. What do you see there? How does it all look in the dark? Can you make out the shapes of furniture maybe? And some things on the tea shop counter and different shapes of maybe cups and plates around. How does it all look a bit spooky because it's so dark there? And what can you hear? Maybe there's a bit of thunder in the distance or a chair creaks suddenly, or there's a footstep. Just listen really hard and think of what you can hear. And can you touch anything? Put your hand out and think about what you are touching. Maybe the top of a table. Is it smooth and cold? Or have you put your hand out and suddenly found yourself touching something warm and soft, maybe? What can you feel? And what can you smell? Are there any smells around? It's very quiet and very still. The sort of time when you can really think about what you can actually detect with your nose. Have you got sniff? Can you smell burning? You can smell burning. Something's happening. There's burning and the burning is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and suddenly you open your eyes and there's a dragon right in front of you. Rawr! Now luckily for you it was your birthday last week and your old great 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 uncle bought you a very special pet that has superpowers and your pet can help you now fight the dragon and hopefully save your life. The only problem is we haven't invented him yet. So very very quickly because the dragon's about to start trying to eat you we need to make a couple of lists. First list six animals as fast as you possibly can Dog, um, dinosaur, hamster, five a sheep, and a horse. Right, now we want to have six different superpowers. I'm going to put them on this side of the map. First one, laser eyes. Number two, flying. Number three, let's see, ice power. Number four, super strong. Number five, fire breathing. The dragon can breathe fire, so can we. And finally, number six, time traveling. Okay, the dragon is looking at us hungrily. We get our dice again. We roll the first number. What animal have we got? We have got number one, a cat. The second number. Number two, we have a flying cat. We have a flying cat who is going to save us from the dragon that has just burst into the tea shop. And the rest of the story is going to be for you to write. This is one of the great ways I like to make up different story ideas. I love writing lists. I often find that it's easier to come up with a whole list of different things quickly than if you're just thinking of one thing. So if you're just trying to think of one thing, you're trying to get the right one. Whereas if I just say there's six different animals, 
you can scribble them all down and then decide afterwards which ones you're going to use. So lists are very, very useful for stories. If you ever find yourself getting stuck in a story, try making a list of different ideas as fast as you can possibly write them and then maybe roll the dice to pick one or just pick your favourite afterwards. So I am going to leave you now in the tea shop with the ferocious dragon and the flying cat who has come to your rescue. And I hope you have fun making up some adventures. Just remember that stories don't just have to happen in faraway, exotic sounding places. Stories happen all around us. It's just a case of how you look at things. And if you're getting stuck for story ideas, try making some lists of ideas. Write down as many things as you can possibly think of really, really quickly. I find that's a great way of getting your brain working and coming up with new ideas. And that is all from me today. Thank you for taking part. Thank you for watching. I'll be hanging about afterwards. So if you want to ask me any questions in the chat, put some questions into the comments and I'll be around to answer those. A big thank you to the Abergavenny Book Festival and the organisers for inviting me on. I hope you've had fun with this and hope you have a good weekend. If you go to my website, www.clearfires.com, I've got loads of information about my books, some extra free short stories and lots more ideas for making up your own stories. If you do make anything up or you want to draw some pictures of the stories, please do let me see. I would love to see your work. So once again, goodbye and hope to see you again.